Gentleman from Florida. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chairman Renaki, I'm looking at the report that you handed out this morning, and I was wondering if you could take your copy and turn to page 26. Okay. There's a table on page 26 which consists of your balance sheet, and one of the entries on the balance sheet is under assets, central bank liquidity swaps, which shows an increase from the end of 2007 from $24 billion to $553 billion in change at the end of 2008. What's that? Those are swaps that were done with foreign central banks. Many foreign banks are short dollars and send to our markets looking for dollars and drive up interest rates and create volatility in our markets. What we have done is, with a number of major central banks, like the European Central Bank, for example, we swap our currency dollars for their currency, euros. They take the dollars, lend it out to the banks in their jurisdiction. That helps bring down interest rates in the global market for dollars. And meanwhile, we're not lending to those banks. We're lending to the central bank. The central bank is responsible for repaying us. So who got the money? To financial institutions in Europe and other countries. Which ones? I don't know. Half a trillion dollars and you don't know who got the money? The loan went to the, the loans go to the central banks and they then put them out to their institutions to try to bring down short-term interest rates in dollar markets around the world. Well, let's start with which central banks got the money. There are 14 of them which are listed in our, I'm sure they're listed in here somewhere. All right. So who actually made that decision to hand out a trillion dollars that way? Half a trillion dollars. Who made that decision? The Federal Open Market Committee. Okay. And was it done at one time or in a series of meetings? A series of meetings. And under what legal authority? We have a longstanding legal authority to do swaps with other central banks. It's not an emergency authority of any kind. Anything specific about it? Do you know the, my counsel says Section 14 of the Federal Reserve Act. All right. We actually looked at one of the arrangements and one of the arrangements is $9 billion for New Zealand. That works out to $3,000 for every single person who lives in New Zealand. Seriously, wouldn't it be better to extend that kind of credit to Americans rather than New Zealanders? It's not costing Americans anything. We're getting interest back and it comes back. It's not at the cost of any American credit. We are extending credit to Americans. Well, wouldn't it necessarily affect the credit markets if you extend half a trillion dollars in credit to anybody? We are lending to all U.S. financial institutions in exactly the same way. Well, look at the next page. The very next page has the U.S. dollar nominal exchange rate, which shows a 20 percent increase in the U.S. dollar nominal exchange rate at exactly the same time that you were handing out half a trillion dollars to foreigners. Do you think that's a coincidence? Yes. All right. Well, the Constitution says, no money shall be drawn from the Treasury but in consequence of appropriations made by law. This money is not drawn from the Treasury. Well, let's talk about that. Do you think it's consistent with the spirit of that provision of the Constitution for a group like the FMOC to hand out a half a trillion dollars to foreigners without any action by this Congress? Congress approved it in the Federal Reserve Act. When was that? Quite a long time ago. I don't know the exact date. A hundred years ago? You read it back to 1914, I believe. I don't know whether this provision was in 1914 or not, but the Federal Reserve Act was in 1913. All right. And at that time, the entire gross national product of this country was well under half a trillion dollars, wasn't it? I don't know. Is it safe to say that nobody in 1913 contemplated that your small little group of people would decide to hand out half a trillion dollars to foreigners? This particular authority has been used numerous times over the years. Well, actually, according to the chart on page 28, virtually the entire amount that's reflected in your current balance sheet went out starting in the last quarter of 2007. And before that, going back to the beginning of this chart, the amount of lending was zero to foreigners. It was zero before the crisis, yeah. This was part of the process working with other central banks to, again, to try to 
get uh, dollar money markets working normally in the global economy. All right. My time is very limited. The gentleman's, time, limited is, the gentleman's time is expired. The gentleman <laughs> Thank from you, New York. Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, Inspector Coleman, you're the Inspector General for the Federal Reserve, right? Okay. That's correct. Have you done any investigations concerning the Federal Reserve's role in deciding not to save Lehman Brothers, which led to shockwaves that went through the entire financial system? Um, in that particular area, you know, I don't generally comment on specific investigations, but we do not currently have an investigation in that particular area. All right. What about the $1 trillion plus in expansion of the Federal Reserve's balance sheet since last September? Have you conducted any investigations regarding that? We, right now we have a, um, it's called, we call it a review, and uh, so I don't know if you, the term investigation may have different uh, connotations. So we're actually conducting a fairly high-level review of the various lending facilities collectively, which would include... Um, you know, the TALF, um, a variety of the different programs that are in process. So we're looking at them at a fairly high level to identify risk. Well, I understand that, but we're talking about events that started unfolding eight months ago. Have you reached any conclusions about the Fed expanding its balance sheet by over a trillion dollars since last September? We have not yet reached any conclusions. Do you know who received that money? For the... We're in the process right now of, of doing our review. and um, Right, but you're the Inspector General. My, answer, my question to you specifically is, do you know who received that $1 trillion plus that the Fed extended and put on its balance sheet since last September? Do you know the identity of the recipients? I do not know. We have not looked at that specific area at this particular point on those reviews. And what about um, Bloomberg's report that there are trillions of dollars in off-balance sheets transactions that the Federal Reserve has entered into since last September? Are you familiar with those off-balance sheet transactions? You know, I, I think it may be um, important at this point, too, just to bring up um, a certain aspect related to our jurisdiction. And just to, to clarify perhaps some of my earlier uh, comments. We are the Inspector General for the Board of Governors, and we have direct oversight over board programs and operations, and are also able to look at board delegated functions to the reserve banks, as well as um, its o the board's oversight and supervision of the reserve banks. We do not have jurisdiction to directly go out and, and audit reserve bank activities specifically. Nevertheless, in our lending facilities project, for example, we are looking at the the board's oversight over the program and uh, to the extent that extends out to the Federal Reserve Bank of New York. Well, I have a copy of the Inspector General Act here in front of me, and it says, among other things, that it's your responsibility to conduct and supervise audits and investigations relating to the programs and operations of your agency. That's correct. So I'm asking you if your agency has, in fact, according to Bloomberg, extended $9 trillion in credit, which, by the way, works out to $30,000 for every single man, woman, and child in this country. I'd like to know, if you're not responsible for investigating that, who is? No, we actually, we have responsibility for the Federal Reserve's programs and operations, audits, to conduct audits and investigations in that area. Um, in terms of who's responsible for investigating, would you mind repeating the question one more time? What have you done? to investigate the off-balance sheet transactions conducted by the Federal Reserve, which, according to Bloomberg, now total $9 trillion in the last eight months. I'll have to look specifically at that Bloomberg article. I, I'm not um, – I, I don't know if I have actually seen that particular one. That's not the point. The question is, have you done any investigation or auditing of off-balance sheet transactions conducted by the Federal Reserve? At this point, we're at the very – we're conducting our lending facility project at a fairly high level and have not gotten to a specific level of detail to really be in a position to respond to your question. Have you conducted any investigation or auditing of the losses that the Federal Reserve has experienced on its lending since last September? We're still in the process of conducting that review. Until we actually, you know, go out and, and gather the information, I'm not in a position to really respond to 
to the specific question. So are you telling me that nobody at the Federal Reserve is keeping track on a regular basis of the losses that it incurs on what is now a $2 trillion portfolio? I don't know if you're, you're telling me that there are, you're mentioning that there's losses. I'm just saying that we're not, until we actually look at the program and have the information, we are not in a position to say whether there are losses or to respond in any other way to that, to that particular Mr. Point. Chairman, my, my time is up, but I have to tell you honestly, I am shocked to find out that nobody at the Federal Reserve, including the Inspector General, is keeping track of this. Federal Reserve ever tried to manipulate the U.S. stock market? No, sir. Not that I'm aware of. Not that you're aware of, but you're the attorney, right? That's right. So you might not even know, right? I would expect to know if there were something like that being done. I'm not aware of that at all. And if you did know, you'd be bound by attorney-client privilege, and you wouldn't be able to tell us, right? Uh, sir, if there were something the Federal Reserve were doing outside its legal authority, I would have an obligation to say something about that. All right. So we agree that any participation by the Federal Reserve in the stock market or the futures market is outside the Federal Reserve's legal authority, right? The Federal Reserve has some authority to regulate various aspects of markets and uh, participate in markets in certain ways. So I think your question is too categorical. But uh, I think not, actually. Why don't you answer it? I don't know what would. I don't know. Your question is so uh, overbroad. I don't know where to begin to answer that. I don't think it's that overbroad. I'd like you to tell me whether it's within the Federal Reserve's legal authority to try to manipulate the stock market or the futures market. So I don't believe the Federal Reserve uh, tries to manipulate the stock market. Tries, or come on. No, so do I, they? The Federal Reserve's uh, obligation and what it does in monetary policy is try to influence interest rates, and in that way to uh, maximize employment and to stabilize prices. Now, sure if in that fact the Federal Reserve were trying to do that or doing it, isn't that something that we'd want to know? And. The, it, the, the extent that the Federal Reserve influences interest rates, it does make announcements of that decision immediately. That's it not makes, what I said. I said is, manipulate said, the stock market or the futures market. Wouldn't we want to know? Uh, yes or no? Uh, could you define what you mean by the, I think you know what I mean, Mr. Alvarez. Now, wouldn't it be very helpful to have a GAO audit on that subject? Wouldn't it? I don't know what it is that you're seeking to audit, sir. What uh, I it would just be helpful said. if you could Let's go on to something else. Question. Does the Federal Reserve actually possess all the gold that's listed on their balance sheet? Do they actually possess it? Yes. Has that been audited by the GAO? Uh, I believe that's within the GAO's authority to audit. It certainly is something that our, uh, our independent accountant is able to verify and does. So if I go ahead and ask for a GAO audit, you won't oppose it, right? To auditing the presence of the gold on the facility? I, I don't see any reason to object to that. Good. Now, there's been all sorts of claims of insider trading and front-running by the people who execute the trades for the Federal Reserve in the market. By the way, who is that? Who actually executes the trades for the Federal Reserve in the markets? I haven't heard of any uh, allegations of front-running. Well, that's funny because you're the general counsel, so the, if anybody uh, would know about it, you'd think you would know about it. The, the uh, Federal Reserve Bank of New York is responsible for uh, affecting the transactions implementing monetary policy. Okay. So... Then answer the question. The Federal Reserve Bank of New York. That's your answer? You wanted to know who uh, implements You the, have people uh, sitting in screens the at the Federal Reserve Bank actually executing those trades. You don't delegate that to anyone else? The, no, the Federal Reserve Bank of New York, of course, it's a process where there's several steps. Federal Reserve Bank of New York executes transactions through primary dealers. Uh huh. With okay. Broader, who are the primary market. dealers? So the list of primary dealers is on our website. Do you know any of them? Can you name a single one? Uh, uh, sure. JPMC. Go ahead. What? J.P. Morgan Chase. Okay. Do you mind if we have a GAO audit to see whether it's been front-running or insider trading by them? Do you mind? Is that okay with you? I'm not sure I have any decision-making authority. Well, you're the general the counsel. I want to know if you're going to try GAO, to stop it. GAO audits government agencies, as in you want an audit of a private, sec a private entity. I think that's something that Congress would have to change the authority of the GAO to allow. All right. Now, let's say you're right. That's what we're doing right here, by the way. Let's say that the Federal Reserve gave a billion dollars to a very promising, fledgling institution called the Dick Cheney Savings and Loan. 
whose only asset is an unnumbered Swiss bank account. Don't you think it would be a good idea to have the GAO have authority to look into that? So under the GAO authority as written, a, a loan by the Federal Reserve to a specific entity, say uh, a particular bank, as you've pointed out, would be subject to GAO audit. We don't oppose that. All right. Now, the Federal Reserve has given $1 trillion out, $1 trillion in the past 12 months. That's how much the increase in its assets and liabilities as the balance sheet has, has been. Who got the money? This, by the way, is a question sent to me by Beatrice Delgado. She just wants to know who got the money. Will you tell me? So the uh, most of the increase in our balance sheet has been the purchase of U.S. government securities and the purchase of agency uh, guaranteed securities in the open market from market participants broadly. And what about yeah, the rest Thomas, of it? Time has expired. Uh, All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. But I really think we need answers to these questions, and the only way to get answers to these questions is to have the GAO audit the Federal Reserve. Thank you very much. I, I just wanted to make the point that if the gentleman has more questions, there will be an opportunity to submit them in writing. Uh, that uh, opportunity will be available. Mr. Bruce, uh, the gentleman recognized for a, a couple of minutes. Thank you. Mr. Liddy, you said before that there's 20 or 25 people who were involved in the credit default business. What are their names, please? I don't have their names at my disposal, sir. Well, I'm sure you remember a few of the names. I mean, they did cause your company to crash. You know, I've been at the company, as you know, for six months. I, I don't know all the people that, are, that were in AIGFP, and many of them are gone. Well, they're or gone. It doesn't really matter. I want to know who they are. Names, please. Yes. Uh, if you're asking for the names of the people who got the bonuses at FP, is that? Nope. I'm asking for the names of the people who ran the credit default business, the 20 to 25 that you referred to earlier that caused your company to lose $100 billion. Uh, if it's possible to provide you the names, we will. If we're, if we're, we will cooperate with you. Well, that's good, but I want to know the names you know right now. I don't know them, sir. Not a single one. You're talking about a group, a small group of people who caused your company to lose $100 billion as you sit here today. You can't give me one single name. The single name I would give you is Joseph Cassano. Who That's ran... a good start. You already gave that name. Give me another name. I, I, I just don't know them. I, I, I do not know those names. I don't have them all at, at my command. Well, how can you propose to solve the problems of a company that you're now running if you don't know the names of the people who caused that problem? Because there are great people running AIGFP now who do know each and every one of those individuals. That's a great thing to say, but the fact remains that I would expect you to at least know more than one name. How about two names? Give us one more name. Yes. I, 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 I'm just not going to do that, sir, because that will provide, that will be, be a list of people that we could do, individuals who want to do damage to them could do that. Well, listen, just not these same that. people could now be working right now, today, at Citibank. Is it more important to protect them, the ones who caused the $100 billion loss, or protect us? Which is more important to you right now? The important thing is to protect both. I, I, I will, if that's the information you want, we'll do everything we can to cooperate with you. I'm just not going to sit here and give it to you until I understand what the implications are. Can I count on you to give us that list? I, yes or no? I, I will, I, I do not know. I will consult with our general counsel and decide what the appropriate course of action is. Not the answer I was hoping for, but my time is up. Thank you, sir. And I approve this message. Religious fanatics try to take away our freedom in Afghanistan, in Iran, and right here in Central Florida. Wives, submit yourself to your own husband. Daniel Webster wants to impose his radical fundamentalism on us. She should submit to me. That's in the Bible. Webster tried to deny battered women medical care and the right to divorce their abusers. Submit to me. He wants to force raped women to bear the child. Submit to me. Taliban Dan Webster hands off our bodies and our Workers don't even get fair pay. Workers don't even get fair pay. After months of mounting anger, the House of Representatives finally hauled in eight CEOs of America's biggest bailed out banks. But many members of Congress didn't share the public's outrage. Maybe that's because, as the Center for Responsive Politics reports, nearly every member of the committee received contributions associated with these same financial institutions during the 2008 election cycle for a total of $1.8 million. Committee co-chair Spencer Bacchus got nearly $117,000 from the same banks brought in to testify.
And I, I think you and I both agree that we need to get the government and government uh, uh, investment uh, out of the banks as soon as we can and uh, get about the business of you doing what you do well and uh, with a minimum of uh, unnecessary influence for, and interference from us. So thank you very much for your presence. I cannot believe no one's prosecuted you on this. But then again, we've had Some who were outraged used most of their time to vent. I don't really have a question, but I was told that I can use the five minutes because the questions I have, you've answered them. America doesn't trust you anymore. For most of the seven-hour hearing, the CEOs grinned and bore it. But one exception came late in the day when Florida Representative Alan Grayson pointedly interrogated Vikram Pandit, CEO of Citigroup. And I'd like to focus specifically on a deal the government made several months ago with Citigroup. In the deal Grayson is talking about, the government promised to bail out Citigroup to the tune of $250 billion if loans and securities backed by risky mortgages proved to be worthless, a strong possibility according to some experts. In exchange, the government got just $7 billion in Citigroup preferred stock. That seems like the worst deal since the Indians sold Manhattan for $24 worth of costume jewelry. All right, now in this deal, Citibank took the first $29 billion in losses and then the taxpayers take 90% of the remainder. Is that correct? First, $30 billion of the losses, and then Citigroup uh, takes the, the remaining 10%. Well, the bottom line, you can correct me if I'm wrong, Mr. Panet, but the bottom line is that the government has assumed liabilities here for this designated pool that amount to $250 billion, more or less. Isn't that correct? Congressman, we bought insurance from the U.S. government we paid a little bit more than $7 billion for buying insurance that allowed us to take the first $30 billion of losses and then 10% of losses after that. So the government gets $7 billion in preferred stock and the government's on the hook for $250 billion in losses. Is that correct? We're on the hook first for the losses we talked about and the $7 billion of insurance is for losses beyond that. Not unlike every other insurance contract, whether you buy insurance on your house, your car, you know, you pay insurance premiums, you're on the hook for your deductible, and then, of course, the insurance company is liable for the value beyond that. You tell me, Mr. Panay, where I can get a deal like this, where I can get $250 billion in insurance, as you put it, for toxic assets that barely have a bid in the marketplace and only pay $7 billion for that. You tell me where I can get a deal like that. Congressman, the only thing I would say to you is that these aren't necessarily toxic assets at all. The government has gone through these assets very carefully. They've gone through what the expected losses might be on this. They did their work. Uh, and I think that's an important aspect that is not in this document. Well, if it turns out that they're not truly toxic and there is an upside, who gets the upside? Their city's profits. Right. So you get 100 percent of the upside and the government gets 90 percent of the downside, correct? Uh, that is what the insurance contract is designed to do. Have you heard the phrase, Mr. Panet, heads I win, tails you lose? Uh, I appreciate that, Congressman. I don't think it applies here. Is this uh, on your balance sheet, this arrangement? Yes, it is, Congressman. Do you know if it's on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet? They are responsible for $234 billion of losses. Do you know if the Federal Reserve put it on its balance sheet? Uh, Congressman, I couldn't tell you. I think there is some of this is with the FDIC, some of this is with the Treasury, some of this is with the Federal Reserve. I don't know the exact details. We're happy to get back to you. The gentleman's time has expired. The gentleman from Connecticut. So are you satisfied with what you got out of your five minutes today? No, I don't know anybody could be. We, we have this gaping, enormous potential liability for the federal government, $250 billion. And I heard some sort of, I don't know, line about how the, the, the taxpayers are getting $7 billion in preferred stocks, so they should be happy about it. I don't buy that at all. I don't think that any rational person could be happy with a deal like that. I think that um, the Federal Reserve in particular was taken for a ride. And uh, I'm very concerned that none of this is being disclosed on a timely basis to the taxpayers. And I can't imagine that any of this is for the good of the taxpayers. So I'm, I'm very, very concerned about the terms of these deals and I think we've just scratched the surface. And the surface um, needs more than a scratch.
Thank you. Uh, it was announced today, earlier today, that there will be a hearing on H.R. 1207, the bill to audit the Federal Reserve Bank. This will be the first independent audit in the Federal Reserve's 96-year history, and it's long overdue. Months ago, I asked the Vice Chairman of the Federal Reserve who received the $1 trillion in funds that the Federal Reserve has handed out to domestic institutions. He said, I'm not going to tell you. And then more recently, the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, I asked him who receives the half trillion, we're talking about $500 billion, that the Federal Reserve handed over to foreign central banks. Who did they disseminate that money to? And he said, I don't know. Half a trillion dollars, and he doesn't know. It's long overdue. We need to audit the Federal Reserve, and I'm happy to say that that's, we're going to have a hearing on that very soon. Thank you. The gentleman's time has expired. For what purpose does the gentleman from Pennsylvania rise? Without objection, so ordered. Um, the gentleman is recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Madam Chairman. You may recall that a few weeks ago, President Obama came to this chamber, and he addressed the chamber on health care before a joint session of the House and the Senate. During that session, I was privileged to be here, and I saw my colleagues on the far side of the aisle, the Republicans, waving pieces of paper during his speech. And I was wondering what they were. I couldn't imagine. It almost seemed like they wanted President Obama's autograph. I just didn't get it. I heard from one of my colleagues that this is what they called the Republican health care plan. I went over after the speech was over. I picked up a copy that was lying down on the Republican side. And it turns out that the Republicans' health care plan was a blank piece of paper. I inquired further, trying to find out exactly what the Republicans' health care plan is. And it's my duty and pride tonight to be able to announce exactly what the Republicans plan to do for health care in America. It's this. Very simply, it's a very simple plan. Here it is. The Republicans' health care plan for America. Don't get sick. That's right. Don't get sick. If you have insurance, don't get sick. If you don't have insurance, don't get sick. If you're sick, don't get sick. Just don't get sick. That's what the Republicans have in mind for you, America. That's the Republicans' health care plan. But I think that the Republicans understand that that plan isn't always going to work. It's not a foolproof plan. So the Republicans have a backup plan in case you do get sick. If you get sick in America, this is what the Republicans want you to do. If you get sick, America, the Republican health care plan is this. Die quickly. That's right. The Republicans want you to die quickly if you get sick. Now, the Democrats have a different plan. The Democrats say that if you have health insurance, we're going to make it better. If you don't have health insurance, we're going to provide it to you. If you can't afford health insurance, then we'll help you to afford health insurance. So America gets to decide. Do you want the Democratic plan or do you want the Republican plan? Remember, the Republican plan, don't get sick. And if you do get sick, die quickly. Thank you very much, Madam Speaker. Podium to me. I'm yielding. Yes, I'd like to speak from the lectern, if that's okay with you. Do, do you mind? Uh, Can we switch places for a few fine. minutes? Fine. Come on down. Okay, thanks. I want to thank the gentleman for yielding his time temporarily uh, and thank the gentleman for bringing up the important subject of the day, which is financial reform in America. I want to thank the gentleman for this opportunity to talk about one of the key elements of financial reform in both the House bill and the now debated Senate bill, which is auditing the Federal Reserve. And I want to congratulate the gentleman and, in fact, everyone in America, because you now own a hotel chain. Congratulations. It's this one right here. You own the Red Roof Inn. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, that's funny. I don't remember buying the Red Roof Inn. But the Federal Reserve Bank, in its wisdom, has done it for you. The Federal Reserve Bank has seen to it that you have the pleasure of ownership of this delightful chain of hotels that extends from sea to shining sea. You, America, you are now the owners 
of the red roof and chain. Congratulations. Let me explain to you how that happened. Deep in the mists of ancient history, going all the way back to 2007, a foreign company decided that they wanted to do a leveraged buyout of the red roof in chain. And so they turned to Wall Street, and Wall Street, in its magical ability, came up with the money, half a billion dollars, to do that. And part of that money, $186 million, came from entities that were formed strictly for the purpose of providing money so that somebody could end up controlling the red roof in other than the people who originally owned it. These foreigners were able to prevail on Wall Street to come up with the financing to buy the red roof in. And now at that point, the question was, who was actually going to come up with the money? $186 million. The answer was, Wall Street was going to find some sucker, some fool, that would be willing to take $186 million out of his or her pocket and put it into the pockets of this management company, foreign owners. The problem was an earthquake hit Wall Street in 2008 before they could execute on this deal and hand this liability off to John Q. Public. And this financial hurricane that hit Wall Street prevented them from executing on their plan. They had to find some way to come up with somebody, some sucker, who would take over liability for this $186 million loan secured only by this modest hotel chain of limited profitability, being sucked dry already by its foreign owners. And they looked around, and at this point, Bear Stearns was responsible for this. So Bear Stearns looked and looked and looked, tried to find somebody silly enough, unwise enough, to stick this $186 million liability to. And then Bear Stearns itself went kaput, taken over by J.P. Morgan. J.P. Morgan moved in with the help of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve arranged that J.P. Morgan could take over Bear Stearns' liabilities in general. But there were some liabilities that were so odorous, so awful, that J.P. Morgan just wouldn't take them over even though the Federal Reserve was stuck with the liability for the great majority of those assets. And those became the maiden lane assets. And among those assets, the absolute dead loser assets, the assets that nobody in their right mind would want, the assets that were so terrible that J.P. Morton wouldn't take them from Bear Stearns' pocket, from Bear Stearns' dead pocket, even if the Federal Reserve was willing to pay for it, among those assets was the Red Roof Inn. And who ended up with that? The Federal Reserve. That's right, the Federal Reserve Bank. You know, the, that organization that dictates the money supply in this country, that has this magical ability to make money out of nothing. They simply make notations on their records, and magically they have more money than they had the day before. The Federal Reserve Bank decided that they would assume responsibility for a $186 million loan to a hotel chain. The Federal Reserve became the sucker of last resort, and in doing so, the Federal Reserve made you, you, America, the sucker of last resort. Let's move on. After 2008, pretty much nothing happened because nobody knew about it. Nobody even knew what was inside the Maiden Lane LLC pot. Nobody knew that it was the Red Roof Inn or anything else. Nobody knew. Why is that? Because we don't audit the Federal Reserve Bank. All they had to do was come up with a line on their balance sheet that said Maiden Lane LLC, and for two years nobody knew what the heck was in it. And then after enormous political pressure from Congress, from this entire country, the Federal Reserve gave us a list of assets and what they called notional value for those assets. Because, you know, when you can make money, when you can create it, when you can just make it appear, everything's notional. It's all notional. That's all there is. And so we found out at the beginning of this year that among those things that the taxpayers now have responsibility for through the Federal Reserve is this wonderful, enormously valuable, at least they want you to think this, chain of hotels called the Red Roof Inn. And it stretches all the way from California to Maine. In fact, one of the properties happens to be the Red Roof Inn Convention Center property right in Orlando, right in my district. I am so proud. I think I'll stop by there and ask for a free room. So, what happened then? 
Well, what do you think? It went bad. It went really sour. Because right now, it's not such a good time for the hotel industry. And they leveraged this, this business to the gills. They had leveraged it up to here, a half a billion dollars from a, a series of properties that barely made any money in great times. And now it's not so great times, as you may have noticed. So what's happened is very simple. They're not paying on the debt. What was debt is now equity. Because when a company goes bankrupt, when it can't pay its creditors, the creditors take over. And interestingly enough, the Wall Street Journal reported just two weeks ago that they're, the major creditors of the Red Roof Inn are moving in. They're saying, we're not getting our money from this hotel chain, so the two other entities that put up the money to do this leveraged buyout to this foreign group, they're moving in, they're taking the hotels over. They went to Citibank and they said, Citibank, what are you doing? They said, well, we're working it out with them. We're moving in, we're taking over the hotels. They went to the third entity and they said to the third entity, what are you doing? Well, we're trying to work it out with them, but we're taking over the hotels. That's the collateral. Not a single word from the Federal Reserve. Not one single word. Wouldn't it be nice to know what happened to the $186 million that they put up? But we don't know because we don't audit the Federal Reserve. So we can't know. There's no way to know right now. And the Federal Reserve may be, for all we know, letting these other sharks, these other Wall Street sharks, Citibank and the other entity, move in and take over all these hotels. And maybe they're doing nothing to defend the right of the taxpayers to these assets. We don't know. We just don't know because we don't audit the Federal Reserve. So America, congratulations, you own a hotel chain. And in fact, if you keep this up, America, you'll own a whole bunch of hotel chains. Because it turned out that the Made in Lane LLC pot of money that the Federal Reserve assumed liability for, 86% of that is called the hospitality business. So America, before long, Take a look, America. You'll have enough to put a hotel on Marvin Gardens, on Park Place, and probably on Boardwalk, too. You'll own all the hotels in America. And isn't that something? Isn't that something? You didn't even know it. But look, that's not all the Federal Reserve's put up. The Federal Reserve has put up half a trillion dollars in mortgage-backed securities. What are mortgage-backed securities? They are securities backed by mortgages. Securities backed by homes. So guess what, America? Before long, you will not only be owning hotel chains all around this country, but you'll be owning houses too. Maybe your neighbor's houses, maybe your own houses, but not exactly. Because you see, when the Federal Reserve owns these assets, you don't exactly own it. In fact, since we don't audit the Federal Reserve, you don't own it at all. You have no control over it. Actually, what's happening is that when these mortgages go bad, the Federal Reserve owns your home. And if you can't make the payments, the Federal Reserve becomes your landlord. So isn't that interesting? For all this time we've been hearing about socialism, communism, creeping government control, of our economy, how we shouldn't have the government owning GM, how we shouldn't have the government owning major banks, and it's been happening by stealth because we don't audit the Federal Reserve. How else could it possibly be that we could end up owning a hotel chain and not even knowing about it? If you're concerned about socialism in this country, if you're concerned about communism, about government control, let's audit the Federal Reserve. And let's find out once and for all who owns the hotels, who owns the houses, and let's try to put this wild beast that creates money out of nothing and jams it into the pockets of special interests like Maiden Lane, like Bear Stearns, like J.P. Morgan, like all their friends. Let's put them under some degree of restraint before it all comes crashing down, these hotels, these, ho these houses, before it all comes crashing down on us. Because every time the Federal Reserve makes that money, every time they do that, every time they create that dollar by their magic, they're taking the dollar that's in your pocket and they're making it cheaper, worth less. Okay, and I'm going to reclaim my time now. All right, that's um, fine. Let me thank the gentleman for... One last word, if I may say this, if the gentleman will yield. Audit the Federal Reserve. All right. Thank you very and, much. And let I me just back. add that the gentleman's presentation is not part of the progressive hour. I didn't, I thought we were going to talk about financial reform. <clears throat>
Mr. Provenza, you've mentioned several times today in your testimony the importance of transparency. Can you explain why that's important? I think the, the committee has uh, talked about that several times, that it, it wants to see a strategy for how uh, money is being spent and understand how it's being spent and have reporting back from institutions that it's being used for the purposes desired and, and so in order to give uh, assurances to Congress and American taxpayers that it's being used for the appropriate uh, purposes, we want greater transparency and accountability. Is it fair to say that when hundreds of billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money is, is being spent, the taxpayers have a right to know how? Yes. Mr. Cohn, uh, how much has the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve increased since September 1? Uh, it's increased from around $800 billion to about $2 trillion. And uh, what was that money spent on? That money was lent. Uh, it was lent to banks, investment banks. It was uh, uh, spent on uh, lending through the commercial paper market, and it was uh, lent to foreign central banks that lent dollars to their banks to take pressure off the U.S. U.S. dollar market. So it was. It wasn't spent. It was lent. Which institutions received that, and how much for each institution? Uh, I don't know which institutions, which specific institutions received it, but uh, by categories of institutions, uh, that's uh, captured in our balance sheet that we publish each week. But well, we would like that in writing, Mr. Cohn, is, uh, for the hearing record. Okay. I'm sorry, what in writing, Mr. Chairman? The answer that you didn't have right off the top of your head to that question. Okay. But I, I, I think I would... Uh, you're going to hold a hearing on this, Mr. Chairman, and I think I would be very, very hesitant to give the names of individual institutions. In fact, I think it would be a very bad idea because I think it would undermine the utility of the facilities that we're giving. But I think we should say more about the categories of institutions. Mr. Cohn, you just said that $1.2 trillion has been lent or spent, as the case may be. That's $4,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Don't Americans have the right to know how you spent that money? Uh, yes, they have every right to know the purposes for which we spend it, uh, the types of spending, the types of lending that's going on, uh, how the types of collateral we're taking, and what we expect to accomplish with that. All right. Well, specifically, I'd like to know how much was given to Credit Suisse and what you got in return, how much was given to Citibank, what you got in return. If you put out $50 billion to Credit Suisse, the taxpayers need to know that. I'd be very concerned, Congressman, that if we published the individual names of who was borrowing from us, no one would borrow from us. The purpose of our borrowing is not to support individual institutions, but to support the credit markets. Has that ever happened? Have people ever said, we will not take your $100 billion because we people never, will find out about well, it? We said we will not publish the names of the borrowers, so we'll have no test of that. Well, what gave you the authority to say that? Isn't that something that we should be deciding, not you? I think you uh, gave us the responsibility in the Federal Reserve Act to oversee the stability of the financial system through our lending facilities to be the lender of last resort, and we are trying to execute that to the best of our abilities. And you're saying that that entitles you to keep secret the expenditure of $1.2 trillion, $4,000 for a man, woman, and child in this country? I don't think we're keeping it secret. I think we're releasing a lot of information about it, but I would personally, I have no, I don't, you know, the I would personally be very, very reluctant to release the individual names of the bar. What do you think might happen if people knew how their $1.2 trillion had been spent? Do you think they might be angry? No, I, uh, I don't know, obviously. I think that uh, they can judge how the money is spent from what, or how the money is lent from what we're telling them and whether it's having an effect, and I think it's having a positive effect in a number of markets. Uh, we've seen the commercial paper market, interbank market, etc. So I think it's it's been ef effective, but we need to do more. Mr. Cohn, we're talking about secret payments of 1.2 trillion dollars. I think you need to rethink your approach here. By the way, were these assets marked to market? Uh, some of them were. Some of them were loans. Why not mark these assets to market and let well, people know the that current value of this 1.2 trillion that you spent? The ones that have market values are marked to market. So how much of them don't have market values? Market. How much of them are worthless? Uh, none are worthless. Then why don't you mark them to market? 
Well, we are marking the ones – we are marking the ones to market that have market values. All right. My time is up. Thank you. I – as I said earlier, I just – for people to understand, this goes under – the authority, as I understand it, came from a statute passed during the Depression. It was fairly dormant, at least as we know it for a while. It – we were told in September – I will just – Mr. Bernanke summoned a meeting of the Congressional Leadership Committee as well and announced to us, Mr. Paulson, in September that they were going to advance $80 billion to AIG. I said, somewhat surprised to the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, do you have $80 billion? He said, I have $800 billion. He obviously was lowballing what he had, maybe made some money in the future. That was in September. I don't think the program had been active before. Clearly, a lot's happened. And as I announced earlier, I spoke to the Chairman last week. We have a hearing that we are setting. Mr. Bernanke will be up here, and we will be having a hearing specifically on this program. And I say that the questions the gentleman raised, these are now questions we will be considering. And I think at an appropriate time, we'll be looking at that statute. I think this is probably not the time with turmoil in the markets to be amending it. But the subject the gentleman raised will be the subject of an entire hearing in February. Gentleman from Connecticut. The gentleman from Florida, Mr. Grayson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's been a lot of discussion today about how we should deal with systemic risk in the future. I'm concerned about how we're dealing with it now. What I'm seeing is a massive transfer of wealth from the taxpayers to the banks in the name of systemic risk. And I'm concerned about that. Can you tell me if there's any response to a threat to the system, a systemic risk that does not involve the transfer of hundreds of billions of dollars out of the taxpayer's pocket to the banks? Let's start with Mr. Ryan. I don't know where you're really going with your question, so I'm just going to give you my answer. We, in our industry, are – we're in a very tough situation. I think that government at all levels has done an excellent job on balance with no real playbook and, quite frankly, most of the regulators with inadequate information. And in order to keep this system stable, the government needed and did make funds available to core financial institutions, and they're essential to our economic health. So I'm very pleased they've done it. What we're talking about here is how do we make sure in the future that we have the ability to look over the horizon and to make some decisions to limit the possibility that we run into this situation again? Mr. Ryan, I understand that many people seem to regard the fact that we've already taken trillions of dollars and made them available to certain financial institutions who have failed to be a sort of a happy coincidence that we're bailing these people out for the good of the country. I understand that that's the view of many, but I'm wondering if there's any other way to do it. That's my question. Is there another way to deal with a systemic risk problem that does not involve the transfer of funds from the government, from the taxpayers, to private entities? In other words, Wall Street socialism. Let's try Mr. Bartlett. There's one way, and that is for this committee and the Congress to pass a systemic risk legislation and provide for a statutory authority to regulate systemic risk. As far as the current crisis, we are in a crisis. The financial services industry is largely illiquid, has a crisis, and that crisis then has then spread to the rest of the economy, whether it's through foreclosures or unemployment. And so the government has taken a number of actions that are costly, TARP, TALF, the new toxic assets thing, the money market guarantees, FDIC guarantees, in order to stabilize the system so that the economy can recover. For the economy to recover, the recovery starts with the financial institutions and the financial services industry, or it doesn't recover. And that's why this Congress is authorized and the regulatory agencies have taken steps to stabilize the situation. Right. But what people are sensing is the idea that they're not getting anything in return. They're being threatened with this idea that the financial system will collapse or it is collapsing, and therefore money has to be taken from the taxpayers and given to the financial system basically in return for nothing. And what I'm asking is, is there an alternative to that? Because, frankly, a lot of people are beginning to see it as extortion. Let's try Ms. Williams. 
I would say that part of this has to do with the investment that's being made. And I think it's important to look at this in terms of an investment. And in particular, if you look at TARP and the Capital Purchase Program, the government has made an investment. Now, we have yet to see what the return will be on that investment, but that was the approach that was taken. Now, when we talk about systemic risk, it seems that we're always talking about letting people off the hook for the mistakes that they made in the past. And it seems to me that that's the opposite of another concept that we've tried to preserve here in Congress, which is moral hazard. Is there a way to deal with systemic risk that does not involve compromising on moral hazard? Dr. Vaughn? Um, it, I, it, others have mentioned this issue about uh, creating a systemic risk regulator and then publicly branding institutions and saying, I hear this company, this is systemically risky and therefore uh, does that create a, uh, an impression of too big to fail. I do think that's a risk. I really think that's a risk. I don't know how, how that deals with it. I've talked to a lot of people and I've had some people say to me, look, the horse is already out of the barn and uh, you can't get it back in. Um, I am equally outraged. I'm a taxpayer and I am outraged uh, at what's going on. This sort of heads I win, tails you lose that we seem to have evolved to in the last decade. Uh, and I, you know what, I am I'm not a bank regular, I'm, a, I'm an insurance regulator, so I can't tell you how to fix the problem, but boy, I would sure like to find a way so it doesn't happen again. I'm with you on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, my time is up. Thank you, Vera. Mr. Speaker, now that help to Haiti is on the way, and that we're doing the best we can to save lives and to reconstruct lives in that torn country, I think this is a good time to look back and to give some thought to people's reaction to what happened in Haiti, to do a sort of a post-mortem of the post-mortem. And in particular, I want to revisit one comment that was made after that time, the comment by Pat Robertson. He claimed that the earthquake in Haiti was the result of a pact with the devil that the people of Haiti had made to achieve an end to slavery and independence at the beginning of the 1800s. I thought that was an interesting comment to make, it turns out that there were two devastating earthquakes in Haiti before their independence, before their so-called pact with the devil, before their end to slavery. And in the 200 years plus since their so-called pact with the devil, Haiti has actually been pretty much earthquake free. Now you compare that to the neighboring country, the Dominican Republic. In 1946, the Dominican Republic had a devastating earthquake actually it's hard to believe, more than 10 times more powerful than the earthquake that Haiti experienced two weeks ago. The Dominican Republic had no pact with the devil, and therefore, if I can use the word therefore in this context, was laid low. So under Pat Robertson's logic, one would have to conclude that, in fact, Haiti has benefited tremendously by what he depicted as this pact with the devil. And uh, I wonder, in contrast, how well Pat Robertson's followers uh, have made out with their own pact with the devil. And what I mean is this. Pat Robertson ran for president in 1988. He did something in that year that nobody's done before or since. He brought three million volunteers to his campaign. He got millions of people involved in the Republican Party all across the country. Uh, in the end, he came in third, but he activated the Christian right, and all those people joined the Republican Party with something in mind, a couple of things in mind. One thing they wanted was that they wanted an end to gay marriage. And for years when the Republican Party was in charge of this country, the House, the Senate, the Supreme Court, the presidency, the Republican Party did nothing to accomplish that for Pat Robertson's followers. Similarly, these people wanted an end to abortion in America. And I'm not going to say whether that was right or wrong or whether they're right or wrong. But I will point out to you that when the Republicans were in charge, the Senate, the House, the White House, the Supreme Court, once again, they did nothing to help Pat Robertson's followers accomplish what they wanted. So tonight I asked those people, the Christian right, what about your own pact with the devil? How's that worked out for you? I yield the rest of my time. The gentleman yields his time. Uh, the pre existing gentleman. conditions to take care of the 47 million people in this country who have no coverage at all. There is no plan, and that's what I meant when I said the Republican plan really is don't get sick 
And if you do get sick, die quickly. But, but you're, you're, insurance you're, companies you're, like that too. You're saying that Republicans want sick people to die quickly. You're they branding have no all plans. So that's that, that maybe they have no plan. They say they have plenty of plans, but if they uh, they that you you really believe they Republicans want sick people to die quickly. Look, what I want is for us to work together to solve our problems, and I don't see the Republicans doing that. There's no effort by the Republicans to actually pass any kind of bill. No bill whatsoever. They just want to stop everything. Has, has any Democratic leader asked you to apologize to no. the Republicans? No. Plan because, on and you know why? You know why they haven't asked me? Because I'm saying what everyone else has been thinking, but no one else has been saying. And, and so you have no intention of apologizing? Of course. The, apologize? Do I'm not the one who should be apologizing. They should apologize to America. These nattering nabobs of negativism have to stop blocking every single thing that we try to do here, or at least come up with something resembling a plan of their own. The Republicans are sort of comparing you to the Joe Wilson situation, the no, congressman. The well, well, how is it not the same? Because I didn't insult the president in front of 40 million people. But you did insult Republicans. Every Republican. No, they what the really Republicans really have been doing is an insult to America. But you're They've been dragging their feet. These are, are foot-dragging, knuckle-dragging Neanderthals who think they can dictate policy to America by being stubborn. And I think it's, the time is over. We had an election. That's it. Now we have to move ahead in just the way the president... Thank you very much. I have some questions for Dr. Ikeda. Uh, and this has to do with uh, the ATSDR's activities with regard to the island of Vieques in Puerto Rico. Are you familiar with the ATSDR's activities regarding Vieques? Yes. All right. Um, is it fair to say that it's within scientific knowledge that the military has released uh, toxins in various places, including Vieques and elsewhere, uh, where the military has done bombing? Is it fair to say that we know to a scientific certainty that the military has released toxins into the environment in areas that it's done bombing? We're focused on the, the human health aspects, um, of environmental exposures, and our work in Vieques has not documented human health exposures or human health you know, uh, impacts related to military activities in Vieques. Okay, Doctor. My question was, is it fair to say with a scientific certainty that bombing has led to environmental damage through the release of toxins? That's my question. I can't speak to the environmental damage. Our focus is on, on the human health aspects of exposures in the environment. All right. Is it fair to say, Doctor, to a scientific certainty that the release of mercury into the environment can cause human health damage? So mercury has been associated with negative health impacts, yes. And the same thing is true of Agent Orange, right? Yes, correct. And the same thing is true of depleted uranium, right? Yes. And the same thing is true of napalm, right? Yes. All right. Now, can you tell me how much napalm was released in Vieques during the half century of bombing by the Navy? I'm sorry. I don't have that information. Do you have any idea? I don't know. No, we'd have to get back to you. Do you, can you tell me how much depleted uranium was released on Vieques during a half a century of bombing by the Navy? Again, I'm sorry. I don't have that information. Does anybody within your agency have that information? I certainly will check and get back. Can you tell me how much Agent Orange was used and released into the environment at Vieques over the course of half a century? Again, I'm sorry. Can you identify for me with specificity any of the environmental toxins that do cause damage to human health that you know or don't know was released into the environment at Vieques at any time in the past 60 years? I couldn't do that with any specificity, so we'd have to get that information back to you. All right. Is it fair to say that you really can't make a firm judgment or even a wild guess as to whether there's been damage to health, human health in Vieques without knowing what toxins were released, when, and how much? So I'm sorry that I don't know the specifics about the report, but the, the final uh, results from the report have shown that th there were not human health impacts related uh, to the, the military activities in Vieques. Doctor, if you don't know whether or how much Agent Orange was released, how could you possibly reach that conclusion? No, I, I'm saying that I'm sorry that I personally don't have the information, but the, the information in the report is, is final. Well, doc, Doctor, I'll represent to you that nobody 
in that report, involved in that report, which to some degree preceded your time at the agency. Nobody working on that report at ATSDR, as far as I know, knew the answer to that question. Nobody knows at ATSDR how much H&R was released. Nobody knows how much NAPOM was released. It wasn't in the report. Now, given that fact, given the fact that you were not told exactly what toxins were released by the military during the bombing, is it fair to say that we don't really know with a firm answer whether the bombing caused any health damages on the island or not? Again, I would say that based on the information that we do have, we did not find evidence of human health impacts, negative human health impacts related to the military bombing. Doctor, if you know nothing, then really you can't say anything, right? I'll stand by my answer again. I'm sorry, I don't have the personal information, but according to our report and the work that we've done and the data that we do have. I'll ask you to assume hypothetically, since you don't have that information here with you today, if the Navy has not released the information to you or the people of Vieques or even to us in Congress, the information about how much of these toxins were released during their bombing, is it fair to say then that you cannot reach any firm final scientific conclusions without the information that you need in order to be able to reach that conclusion? Again, I would say that the, based on the information that we have, we believe that our conclusions are valid. Mr. Provenza, you have mentioned several times today in your testimony the importance of transparency. Can you explain why that is important? I think the, the committee has uh, talked about that several times, that it, it wants to see a strategy for how uh, money is being spent and understand how it is being spent and have reporting back from institutions that it is being used for the purposes desired and, and so in order to give uh, assurances to Congress and American taxpayers that it is being used for the appropriate uh, purposes, we want greater transparency and accountability. It is fair to say that when hundreds of billions of dollars of the taxpayers' money is, is being spent, the taxpayers have a right to know how? Yes. Mr. Cohn, uh, how much has the balance sheet of the Federal Reserve increased since September 1? Uh, it has increased from around $800 billion to about $2 trillion. And uh, what was that money spent on? That money was lent. Uh, it was lent to banks, investment banks. It was uh, uh, spent on uh, lending through the commercial paper market, and it was uh, lent to foreign central banks that lent dollars to their banks to take pressure off the U.S. U.S. dollar market. So it was. It wasn't spent. It was lent. Which institutions received that, and how much for each institution? Uh, I don't know which institutions, which specific institutions received it, but uh, by categories of institutions, uh, that's uh, captured in our balance sheet that we publish each week. But well, we would like that in writing, Mr. Cohn, is, uh, for the hearing record. Okay. You, I'm sorry, what in writing, Mr. Chairman? The answer that you didn't have right off the top of your head to that question. Okay. But I, I, I think I would... Uh, you are going to hold a hearing on this, Mr. Chairman, and I think I would be very, very hesitant to give the names of individual institutions. In fact, I think it would be a very bad idea because I think it would undermine the utility of the facilities that we are giving. But I think we should say more about the categories of institutions. Mr. Cohn, you just said that $1.2 trillion has been lent or spent, as the case may be. That is $4,000 for every man, woman, and child in this country. Don't Americans have the right to know how you spent that money? Uh, yes, they have every right to know the purposes for which we spend it, uh, the types of spending, the types of lending that's going on, uh, how the types of collateral we're taking, and what we expect to accomplish with that. All right. Well, specifically, I'd like to know how much was given to Credit Suisse and what you got in return, how much was given to Citibank, what you got in return. If you put out $50 billion to Credit Suisse, the taxpayers need to know that. I'd be very concerned, Congressman, that if we published the individual names of who was borrowing from us, no one would borrow from us. The purpose of our borrowing is not to support individual institutions, but to support the credit markets. 
Has that ever happened? Have people ever said we will not take your $100 billion because people will find out about it? We said we will not publish the names of the borrowers, so we'll have no test of that. Well, what gave you the authority to say that? Isn't that something that we should be deciding, not you? I think you uh, gave us the responsibility in the Federal Reserve Act to oversee the stability of the financial system through our lending facilities to be the lender of last resort, and we are trying to execute that to the best of our abilities. And you're saying that that entitles you to keep secret the expenditure of $1.2 trillion, $4,000 for a man, woman, and child in this country? I don't think we're keeping it secret. I think we're releasing a lot of information about it, but I would personally, I have no, I don't, you know, the I would personally be very, very reluctant to release the individual names of the bar. What do you think might happen if people knew how their $1.2 trillion had been spent? Do you think they might be angry? No, I, uh, I don't know, obviously. I think that uh, they can judge how the money is spent from what, or how the money is lent from what we're telling them and whether it's having an effect, and I think it's having a positive effect in a number of markets. Uh, we've seen the commercial paper market, interbank market, etc. So I think it's it's been ef effective, but we need to do more. Mr. Carmen, talking about secret payments of $1.2 trillion, I think you need to rethink your approach here. By the way, were these assets marked to market? Uh, some of them were, some of them were loans. Why not mark these assets to market and let well, people know the that current value of this $1.2 trillion that you've spent? The ones that have market values are marked to market. So how much of them don't have market values? Market. How much of them are worthless? Uh, none are worthless. Then why don't you mark them to market? Well, we are marking the ones we are marking the ones to market that have market values. All right, my time is up. Thank you. I, um, as I said earlier, uh, I just for people to understand, this goes under uh, the authority. Of this, as I understand, it came from a statute passed during the Depression. It was fairly dormant, at least as we know it for a while. It, uh, we were told in September, I will just, Mr. Bernanke summoned a meeting of the Congressional Leadership uh, Committee as well and announced to us, Mr. Paulson, in September that they were going to uh, advance $80 billion to AIG. I said, somewhat surprised to the Chairman of the Federal Reserve, do you have $80 billion? He said, I have $800 billion. He obviously was lowballing uh, what he had, maybe made some money in the, in the future. That was in September. Um, I don't think the program has been active before. Clearly, a lot's happened. Uh, and as I announced earlier, I spoke to the chairman uh, last week. We have a hearing that we are setting. Mr. Bernanke will be up here, and we will be having a hearing specifically on this program. And I say that the questions the gentleman raised, these are now questions we will be considering. And I think at an appropriate time, we'll be looking at that statute. I think this is probably not the time with turmoil in the markets to be uh, amending it. But the subject the gentleman raised will be the subject of an entire hearing in uh, in February. General Connecticut, this back. Without objection. Jim is recognized for five minutes. Mr. Speaker, today I introduce H.R. 5353, the War is Making You Poor Act. The War is Making You Poor Act does three things. First, it requires the administration to carry out the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan with only, that's only, the $549 billion set forth in the President's budget for defense spending without the additional $159 billion the President has asked for for the sake of the so-called emergency war, which now stretches on to nine years in one case and seven years in the other. My view is that $549 billion is enough for these wars or any other wars the President plans to engage in. What this does secondly is that it takes the money that is saved from the war separate allocation and it uses that for a very important purpose with our economy the way it is and people in America suffering. It takes that money or 90 percent of it and it uses that to make $35,000 of everyone's income in America tax free and $70,000 for married couples. Let's be clear about that. Let's be clear about what I said. With the money that is being saved by the Wars Making You Poor Act, we can give $35,000 of every American's income. We can make that tax-free and $70,000 for married couples. And in addition to that, it takes the remaining money and reduces the federal deficit and the federal debt. I think those are three things, all of which need to be done, 
This bill brings them all together. Let's start with the fact that the administration has asked for $549 billion to basically keep the lights on at the Pentagon, and beyond that, asked for another $159 billion for the wars. Let's see exactly how much that means. On this chart here, you can see that the U.S. military spending is as much as the entire rest of the world combined. As much as the entire rest of the world combined. And in fact, the ones who come in second are our NATO allies in Europe who I don't expect to be attacking us anytime soon. Beyond that, you have to go all the way down to China to get to any country that is conceivably ever going to be a military enemy, and we outspend China by over five to one. Beyond that, we get into our allies in East Asia and Australia, and you have to go all the way down to Russia, whom we outspend by almost 10 to 1, before you get to any country that could conceivably be a military opponent. Why is this necessary? If we're going to have military spending that amounts to this much, half of all the military spending in the world, do we need to have on top of that, on top of that base budget, another $150 billion for the war? I think not, particularly when people in America are suffering. So I believe that the thing we need to do is to take that $159 billion that the President has set aside. We're not saying he has to stop the war. We're not giving a cutoff date for the war. We're simply saying you need to fund that out of the base budget of $549 billion, and we take 90 percent of that money and give it back to the American people. And I think most people would be surprised to learn that that is so much money that we've been spending on the war in Afghanistan and the war in Iraq that every single taxpayer in America will be able to get his first or her first $35,000 of income completely tax-free. You won't see dollar one in tax until you make more than that. And in fact, almost a third of Americans don't make more than that, so they will simply be excused from the federal income tax system, and all we need to do is to stop separately funding the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Now, I've heard a lot of complaints from the other side and many complaints from people on our side about the federal debt and the federal deficit. Here's something concrete that you can do. If this bill passes, we'll be able to reduce the federal deficit by $16 billion. You don't have to take my word for it. It's already been scored by the Joint Committee on Taxation. The Joint Committee on Taxation staff has determined that the tax cut that's needed to give every single person in America $35,000 tax-free their first $35,000 would cost less than the wars and would leave over after that another $16 billion. Mr. Speaker, this is an idea whose time has come. It's time for the American people to see that there is no longer any need to go beyond the base exorbitant defense budget that's presented to us by the President, notwithstanding the fact that there are wars in Afghanistan and, wars in, and a war in Iraq. It's simply not necessary. You can see for yourself, enough is enough. $549 billion is plenty, particularly when we're using the Chinese credit card to pay for it all. So I ask for your support, Mr. Speaker, and I hope that the Chamber will consider the H.R. 5353 War is Making You Poor Act. Thank you very much. I yield. Here's this guy with all his inglorious background out trashing the President of the United States for dithering. Your response? Well, my response is, and by the way, I have trouble listening to what he says sometimes because of the blood that drips from his teeth while he's talking. But, but my response is this. He's just angry because the president doesn't shoot old men in the face. But by the way, when he was done speaking, did he just then turn into a bat and fly away? Oh, God, we got to keep a level here. Let me ask you this. Don't you have any Republican friends? <laughs> Some of my best friends are Republicans. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. U.S. Congressman Alan Grayson. All right, just dubbed him Captain Cajones. We'll see if that sticks. Up next. Thank you. Um, what is our next destination for America in space? The next destination for America in space, and I'm not being trite when I answer this, is the International Space Station. We've got to get there four more times this year. Uh, the big, the long-term destination, after we successfully close out the space shuttle program, uh, the ultimate destination is Mars. And there are intermediate points that we are going to have to get to before we are capable of going to Mars. If you gave me all the money in the federal budget today, I could not get a human to Mars. I could not 
morally put a human in a spacecraft and launch them on an eight-month mission to Mars because I do not understand the radiation All right, so what is our next destination in space? The next ultimate destination is No, Mars. the next one. Congressman, the next destination, as I said before, is the International Space Station. And All we've right, got let's to do that not be trite, time. then. What is the one after that? It's Mars. So there's nothing in between, as far as you're concerned. But there are intermediate stops what on are the they? way there. What's the next one? The moon is a, is a destination. Lagrange points are destinations. Which one is next? You mean, where do we go immediately next? Is that, is that the question? That's what next means. Congressman, I, we are in the process of developing a program. I will, ha I will have to be able to give you the details, and I will come back and make it for the record in the coming months. So why are we even talking about how to get to the next destination? We don't even know what that is. Congressman, we do know what it is. We know what, what it is. What is it? Congressman, I, you know, we can go back and forth uh, forever. We seem to have to here. I'm looking for an answer. Okay. The next destination in the Constellation program was the moon. After what about that, now, was, since you're uh, planning Congressman, to eliminate the that? the program of record and the program to which we are working right now, uh, because you have told me that I have to continue to, to work the Constellation program, uh, you know, we're, we're talking about the 2011 budget, but if you ask me right now, the next destination is the moon. Okay, good. Um, now, the Augustine Report uh, came up with four options and several sub-options or alternatives within the options. Which one did the administration adopt? The administration adopted the recommendations of the Augustine Report, which, which was the flexible option? Path. The flexible path. The flexible path. Yes, sir. Okay. So you, that, you that think that... That was the recommendation of the Augustine Committee. All right. Now, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I did read the report. It seems to me that the flexible path involved continuing the Constellation program. Is that a fair statement? Uh, the Constellation... You know, the Augustine Committee did not recommend cancellation of the, of the, of the Constellation program. That's so correct. then I'm right. Uh, you're right that they did not recommend cancellation of the Constellation program? Uh, the, yes, flexible the flexible path, in path included continuation of the Constellation program. The, the flexible path did not necessarily include I think you, you, you're cherry-picking from the report. The, pr the report said... I just want to know why you had all these people come together, the people who knew the most about the space program, and then you ignored their recommendation to continue the Constellation program. Congressman, That's what they, I'm did not, they did not recommend continuation of the Constellation program. What the they flexible said, path did. C Congressman, what the report said was that they find no technical challenges in the Constellation program that cannot be met the way that NASA has always met them. However, to do so will cost a significant amount more than anyone will reasonably be able to place in a budget. Uh, All right. Regarding the budget, it seems to be your plan to put people in space through commercial programs. Is that correct? I intend to put people into low Earth orbit through commercial programs. How often has that happened so far? Uh, we do it today. Explain to me. Go ahead. Well, today uh, I go out and, and I pay uh, USA to operate the space shuttle out of the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, the vast majority of my workforce right now is, is Congress, Congresswoman Edwards mentioned. 89% uh, of the workforce in the shuttle program today are, con are contractors. So you consider the space shuttle program to be a commercial program? I consider the space shuttle program to be evidence that, that commercial entities can successfully just, operate. Please uh, answer the question. My time is limited. Yes. Okay. So what's wrong with continuing it then? We would not, I do not think it would be wise to continue the space shuttle program beyond the, the four additional flights that we're on track to fly right now. I think that would not be prudent. But if one's commercial and the other's commercial, what's the advantage of switching? The advantage is that we, are, we relieve ourselves of the, the responsibility and the cost for operating and maintaining infrastructure as we do today with the space shuttle program. Isn't it we true are, that commercial entities have never put a man in orbit? Ever? Commercial entities have put every human in orbit that we, the United States has flown. If, uh, and, and you can take that up with North American Rockwell or Boeing or the United Space Alliance. Honestly, I'll tell you. My time is up now, so I'm going to tell you this briefly. I think that what you're doing is taking a shot in the dark. You have no way of knowing if any commercial entity will ever be able to put a man in orbit, no matter how much money you throw at them. What you're doing is you're taking NASA's manned space program and making it a faith-based initiative. I yield the rest of my time. Mr. Chairman, I rise today to discuss shocking revelations reported in the media starting last Wednesday, that is nine days ago, and continuing for several days afterward regarding the scope 
of the NSA's spying program, including both foreigners and Americans. The NSA is the National Security Agency. Its duty is, as part of DOD, to protect us against foreign attacks, just as DOD itself is supposed to protect us against foreign attacks. And DOD, like the CIA, is on the side of the firewall dealing with foreign threats as opposed to the FBI and the Justice Department who deal with domestic threats. As of a week ago last Wednesday, The Guardian reported that a particular court order had ordered Verizon, the largest cellular telephone company in America, to turn over its call records for all of its calls. All of its calls. I have the document from the Guardian's website here in front of me. It is a document that it was issued as a secondary order by what's known as the FISA court. That court is the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court established under the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. Let's start with the name of the court, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. As the name implies, as the name of the act implies, the jurisdiction of the court is limited to foreign surveillance and foreign threats. This is by statute. The order itself was printed and posted at the website. Millions of people have seen it since then. And what it purports to be, I say it purports to be, but in fact the uh, agency involved, the NSA, has not denied that this is a valid, real document. It says that the court, having found application of the Federal Bureau of Investigation for an order requiring the production of tangible things from Verizon, specifically Verizon Business Network Services, et cetera, et cetera, um, orders that the custodian of records produces not to the FBI, but to the National Security Agency, a component of the Defense Department, upon service of this order, and continued production on an ongoing daily basis, thereafter for the duration of this order, unless otherwise ordered by the court, an electronic copy of the following tangible things. Right here. Take a look at it. These tangible things are identified in the order as follows. All call detail records or de- telephony metadata created by Verizon for communications, one, between the United States and abroad, which sounds like it might be international, and then two, wholly within the United States, including local telephone calls. On its face, this is an order for Verizon, our largest cellular telephone company, to turn over call records for every single call in its possession. Mr. Chairman, that includes calls by you. It also includes calls by me. In fact, it includes by calls by me when I'm calling my mother or my wife or my daughter. And for those who are listening on C-SPAN or otherwise, it includes every call by you. Now, the first question that comes to mind is, first, is this just for Verizon? Well, we don't know for sure at this point, but the NSA has not denied that there are similar orders at an extent for MCI, for AT&T, uh, for Sprint, uh, for every telephone company that carries any significant amount of data uh, or calls in this country. Another question is, how far back does this order go? The order itself is dated on its face April 25, 2013. One of the more interesting things about this order posted at the Guardian's website is that it has no starting date. Under this order, under the plain terms of this order, Verizon has to go and give the federal government, specifically the Department of Defense, the NSA, all of its call records of all of its calls going to the back to the beginning of time. And this obligation continues until July 19th of 2013, presumably because the order will be renewed at that point upon request of the NSA and the FBI. Let's be clear about this. This appears to be an order providing that our telephone companies providing service to us turn over call records for every single telephone call 
regardless of whether it's international or not. Now, if somebody had come to me nine days ago and said to me, Congressman Grayson, do you think that the Defense Department is taking records of every telephone call that you make or I make or anyone else makes, I would say, no, I have no reason to believe that. It would shock me if it was true. Well, it is true, and it does shock me. Why should we have our personal telephone records, the records of whom we call, when we speak to them, how long we're talking, why should we have that turned over to the Defense Department? What possible rationale could there be for that? Well, I'll tell you what I think the rationale might be, because somehow that makes us safer. Well, let me say to the NSA and to the Defense Department, you can rest assured, there is no threat to America when I talk to my mother. Now, what exactly is wrong with this? What's wrong with this, first of all, is that there is a firewall between the Defense Department and the CIA on the one hand, and the FBI and the Department of Justice on the other. One protects us from international threats, the other one protects us from domestic threats. That's been the law in America since the 1870s, when Congress enacted and the President signed the Posse Comitatus Act. And this order crushes that distinction. It eliminates it. It obliterates it. It kills it now and forever. Now, the second thing that is offensive about this court order is that it clearly violates the Fourth Amendment. The Fourth Amendment reads as follows. The right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures shall not be violated, and no warrants shall issue, but upon probable cause, supported by oath or affirmation, and particularly describing the place to be searched and the purses or the things to be seized. Now, first of all, when the government seizes your phone records, unless you happen to be Osama bin Laden or someone close to him, there is no reason why the government would believe or have reason to believe probable cause that you've committed a crime or you're going to commit a crime or you have any evidence about someone committing a crime. There's no probable cause here. Secondly, the Fourth Amendment requires particularity. There's no particularity when the government insists by court order and under threat of further action that Verizon or AT&T or Sprint or anyone else be required to turn over their phone records to the government. There's no particularity. And this really is the essence of the matter, because if you, if you ask the NSA for a justification, they'll say, well, it's legal. What do you mean it's legal? Well, according to their published statements, including a statement by their director last Saturday, they maintain that it's legal because of a single Supreme Court case decided in 1979 that said that the government, specifically local police authorities, could acquire the phone records of one person once. That's the case of Smith v. Maryland in 1979. And because the Supreme Court says that at that point, the government could acquire the phone records of one person once, the NSA is maintaining that its entire program is legal and that it can acquire the phone records of everyone, everywhere, forever. That is a farce. Now, the other document that came to light last Thursday, in other words, eight days ago as I speak, was a document, again, posted at The Guardian's and then later at the Washington Post's website. And this is a document that is a PowerPoint presentation which, according to the reports, was a PowerPoint presentation to analysts working for the NSA. This PowerPoint presentation is labeled PRISM US 984XN Overview, or the SIGAD used most in NSA reporting.
And what you see to my right is a reproduction of what was posted at the website a week ago. First of all, note that there are certain logos at the top of the page. Gmail, which for those of you who is not familiar, is the largest provider of email services and hosting. It's run by Google. Facebook, many of us are familiar with that. I think my children are all too familiar with it. Spend an awful lot of time on it. Facebook allows, among other things, private messaging between friends. Hotmail, which is Microsoft's email server and service. Yahoo, which performs a variety of functions, including, among other things, hosting a large number of web pages. And by the way, when you go to their web page, they can tell who you are from your IP address. And also, a very widely used email service. Google, I think Google needs no introduction, but I've already introduced it. Uh, Google allows you to do web searches. It, together with Microsoft, has almost 90% of the web search market in the United States. They keep a record of the searches that you make based upon your IP address. Skype, which is a telephone company that transmits calls electronically over the internet. PalTalk, I'm puzzled, I don't know what that one is. YouTube, which is the largest host of videos in the world, and again, can tell which videos you're looking at by your IP address. And AOL Mail, which, as it sounds, is the America Online Mail email service. This document is dated at the bottom April of 2013, meaning last month. or maybe two months ago. Let's take a look inside. One of the pages that's been produced on the Guardian and Washington Post website is this. And by way of background, um, it's been reported that this is part of a longer document it's 41 pages long. Only five pages have been released to the public through The Guardian and through The Washington Post. So I'm sharing with you the five pages that were released a week ago and are now public. Let's take a look at this one. This one says that the NSA's prison program performs the following functions. And bear in mind, this is reported to be a training document given to NSA analysts to explain what they can do in this program. Who are the current providers to the program? Microsoft, Hotmail, etc., Google, Yahoo, Facebook, PalTalk, YouTube, Skype, AOL, and Apple. And what are they providing? Specifically, as the document said, what will you, meaning the analyst, receive in collection? Collection from surveillance and stored communications. The document said it's, it varies by provider. We don't know how it varies. But in general, what you get is the following. Email. The NSA gets email from these providers. Video and voice chat, videos, photos, stored data, VOIP or VOIP, which is an electronic version of your actual words when you are speaking on the phone. VOIP stands for Voice Over Internet Protocol. It's your voice. File transfers, video conferencing, notification of target activity, including logons, in other words, are you on your computer or not, etc. Online social network details, and what is blithely referred to as special requests, as if all that weren't enough already. Now, you might wonder, how does the government actually get this information? Well, the five pages that have been released gives us one answer to that question. Let's take a look at that. If you look at the bottom, the green rectangle, 
you'll see that it says that PRISM collection is directly from the servers of these U.S. service providers. Microsoft, Yahoo, Google, Facebook, PalTalk, AOL, Skype, YouTube, Apple. The plain meaning of this, since it's addressed to the trainees at the NSA, the people who actually be doing the analysis of this data, and the injunction on the left which says, you should do both. The plain meaning of this is that the NSA apparently has the capability to collect directly from the servers of these service providers the information on the previous page. In other words, our emails, our chats, our videos, our photos, our stored data, our voice over internet protocol, our file transfers, our video conferencing, our logins, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, there's an interesting distinction between these two documents. In the first case, with regard to the court order, the NSA's position is that's a valid court order. We regard it as legal. If you don't like it, that's too bad with you. Go change the law. To which I say, fine, I'm going to try to change that law. With regard to the second document, the situation is a little more ambiguous. What the NSA has said publicly is that the green rectangle is actually not correct. Now, bear in mind, no one said that this is not an NSA document. No one said that it's photoshopped. No one said that it is anything other than what it purports to be and what it was reported as. However, the NSA has taken the position that their own document is wrong for reasons that we don't know. And the NSA, in fact, does not have the capability to directly take, collect from the servers of these companies your emails, your, your voice over internet protocol, uh, your photos, and everything else. They say that they, they just don't do that. However, we're still waiting for an explanation of how this green rectangle ended up in this document. If it's not true, they need to explain how and why it's not true. The NSA also says that for reasons not evident from this document at all, they don't do this for U.S. citizens. Now, that raises a host of questions. You might think that there might be something else in this document that says that, but the NSA hasn't maintained that. In other words, they haven't said, if you look somewhere else in this document, you'll find that we don't do this for USA citizens. Unless you think that this is somehow selective on my part, on anybody else's part, it's been reported that the whistleblower pr provided this entire document, all apparently 41 pages, to The Guardian, to The Washington Post, and they've decided on their own to release only these five. So, if there's something that indicates that the NSA is only doing this for Americans, apparently it's not in this document, and we've reached the strange point where people are being trained in the NSA that they will have the ability to get the emails and the other information on Americans, but somehow are told later separately that's not correct. In addition to that, the NSA says that there is some process by which they can distinguish between the emails of Americans and the emails of foreigners. Frankly, that is a technology so advanced to me, it seems like it might be magic. I used to be the president of a telephone company. I have no idea. I have literally no idea how I could distinguish between the email accounts of an American and a foreigner. I don't know how to do it. Maybe they can tell us how they do it, if they're doing it at all. That's the real question, if they're doing it at all. I don't know how they could possibly say, this email account is for a foreigner, this email account is for an American. And if they can't, that means they're taking all the stuff, American and foreign, and having it, using it, looking at it, and destroying our privacy rights. That really is the heart of the matter here. I don't understand why anyone would think, anyone would think that it's somehow okay for the Department of Defense to get every single one of our call records, regardless of who we are, regardless of whether we're innocent or guilty of anything. I venture to say that there are Americans who have never even had a parking ticket. And yet, 
the Defense Department is pulling their call records as well. Now, eventually we will find out whether the NSA's own document is misleading and the NSA is not pulling email accounts and emails and photos and VoIP calls on people who are Americans. Because if you read this document, it sure looks like they are. You know, this is not the first time that we have had this problem. This is not the first time that the government has entered into surveillance on people without probable cause. Many of us remember that there was FBI surveillance of Martin Luther King, including wiretapping and bugging his personal conversations. I thought, perhaps naively, that we have moved beyond that. And in some sense, we have moved beyond that. Because now, they're doing it to everyone. In fact, one could well say that we are reaching the point where Uncle Sam is Big Brother. I submit to you that this program, although the proponents depict it as American as Apple Spy, this program is an anti-American program. We are not North Koreans. We don't live in Nazi Germany. We are Americans and we are human beings. And we deserve to have our privacy respected. I have no way to call my mother except to employ the services of Verizon or AT&T or some other telephone company. I'm not going to string two cups between my house and her house 70 miles away. That doesn't mean that it's okay with me for the government and specifically the Department of Defense to be getting information about every telephone call I make to her. It's not okay with me. I submit to you, Mr. Chairman, it's probably not okay with you. And I know that for most of the people who are listening to me today, it's not okay with you either. Ben Franklin said, those who would give up essential liberty to purchase a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. I agree with that. We do not have to give up our liberty to be safe. I have already heard from people who tell me that they're afraid. That they're afraid they're going to be blown up by some terrorist somewhere. That they're afraid their personal safety is at risk. And it's okay with them if the government spies on them. Well, it's not okay with me. And I stand here on behalf of the millions and millions of Americans who are willing to say, it's not okay with me either. I'm fed up. I'm not going to take it anymore. When we had a civil war, and there were one million armed men in this country who rose up heavily armed to fight against our central government, we did not establish a spy network in every city, every town, every village, every home. But that's what we've done right now. When we had, when I was growing up, 10,000 nuclear warheads pointed at us. And some people believe there was a communist under every bed. Even then, we did not establish a spy network as intrusive as this one. I submit to you that this has gone way too far. And that it's up to us to tell the Defense Department, the NSA, the so-called intelligence establishment, we've had enough. We are human beings. We are a free people. And based upon this evidence, we're going to have to work to keep it that way. That's what I'll be doing. I hope you'll join me. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back the remainder of my time. The gentleman yields back his time. Under the Speaker's announced a policy of January 3rd, 2013, the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. King, is recognized for 60 minutes as a designated.